Good evening with this meeting of the School Board of Independent School District 279. Please come to order. It is February 16th, 2016, and the time is 6.05 p.m. Seated in front of you this evening, from my left, your right, is Director Jessica Craig, Director Bob Gerhardt, um, Director Dean Henke, Director Jim Burgett, Director Jackie Gertz, and Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Kate McGuire. Would everybody please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board members, in front of you is the agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? Hearing none, I would move to accept the agenda as printed. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Director Gerhardt. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries to accept the agenda as printed. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. We hung out as long as we could. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our next agenda item is the audience opportunity to address the school board and if anybody would like to address the school board, um, we have some salmon colored cards in the back of the room. I'll wait a little bit. Um, I don't see anybody moving. Um, so we will move to our next agenda item which is the superintendent's report. Dr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A regular part of the superintendent's report is to share points of pride. Points of pride celebrate students, staff, and community members who are contributing to the accomplishment of our mission, which is to inspire and prepare all students with the confidence, courage, and competence to achieve their dreams, contribute to community, and engage in a lifetime of learning. And I've asked cabinet members to share those points of pride tonight. In the category of achieving dreams, Maple Grove Senior High's Evan Skaya has advanced to National Merit Scholarship <coughs> finalist status. To earn this honor, finalists score in the top 1% on the PSAT among 1.5 million test takers. Finalists are eligible for one of approximately 7,600 National Merit Scholarships. Maple Grove Crimson dance team placed second in the Class 3A state tournament for jazz and fourth place for high kick. Thomas Beskow rose above nine other competitors to finish first in the Maple Grove Middle School Geographic B. He also took a qualifying test to advance to the State B where the top 100 scorers will compete on April 1st. 30 students from our three comprehensive high schools collectively earned 41 awards in the 2016 Minnesota Scholastic Arts Awards competition. Recognition is awarded in a number of categories, earning a gold key, silver key, or honorable mention. Gold key and silver key artworks are on display through February 20th at the Regis Center for Art West Gallery in Minneapolis. Maple Grove Senior High DECA made an impressive showing at the District 4 Conference with 21 students qualifying for the state competition to be held in March. DECA is an international student organization that promotes the concepts of business, finance, marketing, hospitality, and entrepreneurship through competitions that include problem solving, role plays, and prepared oral and written events. Osseo Seniors Michael Tiuku was featured as a Channel 12 standout student for his internal motivation, positive outlook, and leadership qualities. Michael hopes to pursue a career in business after college. Five student athletes from Osseo, Maple Grove, and Park Center Senior High were named to the 2015 All-USA Minnesota football team. Players recognized included Defensive Player of the Year, Amani Hooker from Park Center. Maple Grove Senior High hockey player Taylor Winty recently won a gold medal in the International Ice Hockey Federation U18 World Championship with Team USA. Two of our high school musical theater productions received recognition from the Hennepin Theater Trust Spotlight Awards. Maple Grove Senior's production of Les Mis earned outstanding overall production and outstanding overall performance. Osseo Senior High's production of Wizard of Oz earned honorable mention for overall performance. Both productions, along with several individual students, earned additional recognition. Students will now have the opportunity to work with professionals in the Spotlight Education Program at the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis. Twelve student ambassadors from Northview Middle School visited Zanewood Community School to read with second graders. 
The activity helped build positive relationships while encouraging mentoring and leadership skills for the older students and reading skills for all. Eight students from Park Center Senior and Osseo Senior are in the running to become Act 6 scholars and receive a full tuition scholarship to attend their choice of select local colleges. Candidates will participate in a half-day interactive event where they will demonstrate their academic and emerging urban and community leadership potential. The process will culminate in final selections of scholarship recipients in March. In the category of contributing to community, on Friday, February 12th, the District 279 Foundation hosted its 16th annual A Night Out Gala with 243 people in attendance. This year's theme was school spirit and included an evening of appetizers, silent auction, performances by district student groups, guest presenter Jason Derusha, and a new video which shared the good work of the foundation. This year's event raised $24,000, which will go toward classroom grant opportunities for our students. The Community Mosaic Project, on display at Osseo Senior High until April, is an artistic collection of canvas tiles created by community members from adult artists to young children. Canvases are meant to represent all parts of the community. Visitors to the display can make a donation toward the Osseo Senior High Counselors Fund, which is used to help families in need. Those who donate will receive a tile at the conclusion of the exhibit. Teacher Elise Bengston and the Osseo Lions have been instrumental in creating the Community Mosaic Project. And in the category of lifelong learning, a group of Osseo senior students has participated in a Reader's Choice English workshop designed to increase reading levels by getting students to read more books cover to cover. First trimester results indicate that 81% of the group increased one whole year or more of normal reading growth and more than half the group advanced reading growth by two years or more. Students also discovered benefits in areas such as writing formal papers, personal motivation, and pride in accomplishment. Park Center's Asian Club hosted its second annual Asian New Year celebration. Participants were exposed to a variety of Asian cultures while enjoying performances, entertainment, food, and more. In order to build relationships and bridge school-to-home learning opportunities, the preschool program at Fair Oaks Elementary hosts monthly parent days. Parents are provided information and given time to practice related skills with their child in the classroom. Take-home materials support continued practice at home. Park Center hosted six National Guard members to show how the replacement of a large boiler plant is planned and completed. This offered a valuable opportunity to contribute to community while serving as an example of a well-planned, large-scale boiler replacement project. In the category of mission-driven employees, three Osseo Area Schools teachers have been named candidates for the 2016 Minnesota Teacher of the Year Award. They include Dennis Lukes, vocal music teacher at Palmer Lake Elementary, Kristen Pengra Anderson, fifth grade teacher at Edinburgh Elementary, and Lisa Wistie Shuddy, fourth grade teacher at Basswood Elementary. They will participate in a selection process that cul culminates with the Teacher of the Year being announced in May. All right, thank you. Uh, board members, uh, it is my pleasure to honor two more Osseo Area Schools educators who have earned the premier level of recognition in their respective state professional associations. They join nearly 15 other employees of our school district who have been similarly recognized over the past four years. So I'm going to ask Bill Beckman to stand. He's in our audience tonight. Bill Beckman is a Maple Grove Middle School Global Studies teacher and has been named the 2016 Minnesota Council for the Social Studies Middle School Teacher of the Year. Mr. Beckman teaches eighth grade global studies at Maple Grove Middle School where he strives to help students understand their place in the world and the perspectives of others by learning history and geography. Mr. Beckman's leadership in social studies education includes coordinating his school's geography bee. You just saw an example of that, a young student from Maple Grove Middle School who received an award, serving on the State Geographic Education Steering Committee, presenting at state and local conferences, and co-authoring resources such as Rand McNally's Minnesota Geography Program and the Story of Minnesota's Past, textbook activities. He's the recipient of several local and state professional recognitions and he has served the students in Osseo area schools for nearly 40 years. 
Bill was one of my mentors when I joined the school district 31 years ago as a brand new social studies teacher. And I will be honored to join him at the annual Minnesota Council for the Social Studies Dinner on March 6th, where he will receive this prestigious award. Congratulations, Bill. Thanks. <laughs> And I'm also delighted to recognize Kim Reesgraf. Kim, would you stand? The Minnesota Association of School Administrators has named Dr. Kim Reesgraf, Assistant Superintendent of Administration, as the recipient of its 2016 Outstanding Central Office Leader Award. Dr. Reesgraf is being honored for demonstrating a willingness to take risks, possessing strong communication skills, being a progressive change agent, and having high expectations for self and others. In her assistant superintendent role, she led a design team that developed a long-range financial planning framework and a model that aligns financial resources with strategic priorities. She facilitated strategic priority teams that developed a collaborative decision-making framework and a plan to increase access to full-day kindergarten and preschool. She led the development of performance, a performance appraisal system for all management personnel in the district and oversaw the creation of facility standards used to design our 10-year uh, capital improvement plan. Most recently, of course, she is famous for leading a comprehensive project management process to change grade spans across our school district, including designing a new middle school model and new construction and renovation to the district's three comprehensive high schools. She'll receive this award at a statewide recognition ceremony held in mid-March. Congratulations, Kim. through that one without being teary, aren't you proud of me? <laughs> we'll try one more. Um, this week is School Board Recognition Week, and I want to recognize the important work of our school board. And I take time to do this every year. The key work of school boards is to improve student achievement and increase community engagement to promote education. And in order to accomplish that, the school board sets the vision and the mission for the school district and determines strategies to accomplish our goals. The board sets in place a system of accountability to monitor progress, and further, the board ser serves an important advocacy function, building community and staff support for our goals. Creating the conditions under which almost 20,000 students achieve performance standards is no small task. Add to that the responsibility for pre-K and adult learners, and it's easy to see the importance of school board service. I do think that our public understands that school board members have a tremendous impact on our children's future and on the quality of life in our communities. I'm not sure, though, that community members and others understand the demands of school board service. Our board members spend countless hours preparing for and participating in regular meetings and work sessions. They participate in professional development as a school board and as individuals. For an example, Director Gertz just completed 100 hours of attendance at Minnesota School Boards Association professional development sessions and attained a director's award from MSBA, which you were recognized at the January MSBA uh, meeting here in the cities. Board members also devote time to studying education issues and laws, listening to the interests of parents and staff. In fact, they're never completely off the job as school board members. And board members, in recognition of your service, our CBVAT students made you each a little packet of cards, little note cards for yourself. And I want you to know that those cards have been paid for with a private donation. So board members, thank you very much for your service to our communities and to our students. So thank you. And then lastly, I'd like to report on our legislative, uh, our kickoff to the legislative session. Each year, before the start of the legislative session, we hold a coffee for legislators who represent Osseo area schools. Many of our representatives and senators who represent District 279 attended the event, which was held at Edinburgh Elementary School. The purpose of the legislative coffee is to build relationships with our area legislators, to share our district's legislative priorities, to provide evidence of the work that we're doing to accomplish state goals, and to hear our legislators' perspectives about priorities for the upcoming legislative session. Our legislators have told us that they appreciate the specific information that we provide about how we're using the resources provided by the state to accomplish the goals that they've set for us. 
Edinburgh staff provided evidence to our legislators about the results of their focused efforts to expand pre-K programs and highlighted strategies to help early learners be successful in school. Thank you. Thank you for those reports. Our next agenda item is school board reports and we have a January 26th, January 26th policy committee. Um, Director Gertz. Thank you, Chair Henke. Um, the School Board Policy Committee met here at the Educational Service Center at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, January 26, 2016. Board members Jim Burgett, Bob Gearhart, and I attended. Also attending were the Superintendent Kate McGuire, General Counsel Margaret Weston, and Sarah Vernig, Principal on Special Assignment. The committee reviewed the Policy Committee meeting schedule for 2016-17 school year and the proposed agendas for the committee meetings for the rest of 2016. Five policies were on the agenda, two policies, 511 student fundraising and 532 use of peace officers and crisis teams to remove students with IEPs from school grounds were forwarded to first reading at tonight's school board meeting. The committee reviewed one policy, 542, extended educational field trips but, but has no recommended changes. The committee also reviewed changes to the administrative procedures for the policy. The committee requested additional revisions to policy 510, student activities, and 545, student fees. The next policy committee meeting is scheduled for February 23rd, 2016. Thank you. And we have a February 2nd um, work session. Director Edom. The school board held a work session on Tuesday, February 2nd. The school board reviewed the recommended budget proposal and provided direction for fiscal year 2017 budget adjustments in the general operating transportation, food service, and community service funds. In keeping with, the, in keeping with direction provided by the school board at the November 10th, 2015 work session, the budget proposals included a $1.5 million dollar increase in general fund budget capacity to be targeted towards strategic priorities that support increased student achievement. Based upon new enrollment trends information, the budget proposal also included an increase of 123 students in the fiscal year 2017 enrollment projection. 50% of the revenue attributable to this projected increase will be reserved for additional staffing capacity to be allocated when these student enrollment increases become more certain. Staff then reviewed the budget proposals recommended by division leaders, which reflect the input received from the annual long-range financial planning advisory process. All proposed budget adjustments were submitted through the program efficiency, abandonment, and redirection, also known as PAIR, process. The proposal for $1.5 million increase in the general fund budget capacity is largely targeted toward 15 full-time full employees, classroom teacher positions to reduce K through three class sizes and additional staffing support for middle school interdisciplinary teams and exploratory classes. This increased budget capacity will also provide additional education support professional time to support for cafeteria and recess student supervision, three FTE additional social workers to support secondary student mental health needs, and coach advisory time to accommodate increase student participation in athletics and activities at the senior high schools. The board will take action on the proposed FY 2017 budget at its regular school board meeting on February 2006, back up February 16, 2016. All school board work sessions are open to the public and are also audio taped. Members of the public can access audio recordings of work sessions on our district website. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other school board reports for this evening? Hearing none, okay. 
Our next agenda item is a presentation. We have a school report, Park, Park Brook Elementary, focus on fitness. Principal Scott Taylor, welcome Scott. Thank you, Chairman Jefferson Henke, members of the board, Superintendent McGuire, thank you for this opportunity to share the work that we are doing at Park Brook Elementary. I'm Scott Taylor, principal of Park Brook, and over the past few years we've been implementing a focus on fitness initiative which we have seen dramatic results in the outcomes for our students. I want you to know that this work is based upon research. A few years back, Eric Jensen came to our school district and spoke to the Title I staff. And my staff has also read the book Spark by John Reddy, or I should say some of my staff, the team leaders. And we've had book studies with uh, Eric Jensen's book. So it's based upon research and data that we've been implementing this. <clears throat> Tonight, what I'd like for you to be able to see is focus and fitness in action. What does that look like at the school? Our goals, focus on fitness goals, and then also the results. So focus in fit, on fitness in action. We have before and after school activities throughout the entire school year. I have discovered that to keep the staff in, energized and to keep the students engaged and to keep it fresh and new, we offer different programs, so a program may run for five or six weeks. But we begin the school year with an after-school boot camp, which takes place the first five weeks of the school year, three days a week for an hour after school. And the students are outside engaged in activities. This year I had 140 of our 215 students outside after school. We then move into a morning move session, which meets twice a week before school for kindergarten through sixth grade. And we have somewhere between the different days, 40 to 60 kids that come each morning. We just wrapped up our, from January through early February, the first week, our after school snowshoe boot camp, which met four times a week. And we are just now starting to enroll students in our next session of morning move. And after that, we'll have an after school boot camp. We are excited. We have a new program that we are going to be starting. It's for 15 girls, and it combines both the fitness and also PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention Supports. It's Girls on the Run. We have received a scholarship. It costs $150 per student to participate in this. However, we have been a, given a free or a grant so that we can offer this free to all. 15 girls can participate in this. It's twice a week with leadership, character development, and training for a 5K. We also have focus on fitness field trips. In the fall, following our first boot camp, we, have, we take students down to the Twin Cities, um, or to St. Paul, for the Twin Cities 5K. And I'll show you pictures of these in just a few minutes, but just to give you an overview. In the winter, we have taken students, last weekend we started off with taking our pre-K through second grade to the University of Minnesota for a fun run sponsored by Twin Cities in Motion. <coughs> and then we took our third through fifth grade to the Luminary Lopet and Mini Lopet on Lake of the Isles. This spring, or I guess in winter as well, we'll be taking students to the Kidderod, which will be, it's the first time we are going. It's later this month, which is an outdoor obstacle course and this one will be at night, so the kids will all receive a headlamp in the park to be able to wear to participate in this. We'll be taking students to the YMCA to use their climbing wall and swim and also have water safety lessons. And then this summer, last summer we offered bike trips throughout the summer. This year, we were one of the hosts for the Freedom Schools, so the Freedom Schools will be using our bike grant that we have where we have 30 bikes on a trailer, and they will be combining that with the Freedom School so that we can offer that to the students throughout the summer. Here you can see a picture of our school social worker, Lizette Glick, and she is having her picture taken while taking a selfie with our students at the Twin Cities 5K. You can see we all wear the yellow shirts so we can spot them easily. <laughs> First time I took them, I thought, how am I going to find, I haven't lost a student yet, how am I going to find 
30 to 40 kids as we send them along Snelling, starting at the Capitol, and they all run different paces, <laughs> but you know, they all come in. Twin Cities in Motion just has it set up where we have a spot to meet. And this picture here was from a couple of years ago. Twin Cities in Motion used this picture of our Parkbrook students for their advertisement for the Twin Cities 5K. Going back to this one here, I should mention, the boy on the right, his name is Jason. We have a wellness committee that meets and trying to get the student voice into our school. At the end of the year, at our wellness committee, he said, the one thing we could change with the Twin Cities 5K is to stay longer. Because he said, although he is one of the fastest runners that we have taken, he said those who are the slowest, they come back and they don't get to experience just being down there. So because of him, we stayed. And there was a whole tent that we had never experienced before, and that is where one of my teachers met with those from Girls on the Run and opened up that whole opportunity. So the student voice is very important in this initiative. This year with the fun run at the University of Minnesota sponsored by Twin Cities in Motion, we took our pre-K students. We just, we're not just a K through five school, but we are pre-K through five school. So you can see Michelle Biscow with one of the mothers with three of our pre-K students who went for the run. The students all do receive a medal, and so as some of our students have a number of medals from the runs with the Twin Cities in motion. This picture here is from the Luminary Lopet a year ago, or rather I should say the Mini Lopet, because that is a ski event that the students participate in, and the students, our students, are all wearing the blue hats that the Lopet Foundation prepares for Park Brook students. So there are eight different schools they work with. Their goal is to increase um, populations that are not as represented in some of these outdoor experiences and try to increase that. So our students participate in the mini Lopet, then we have dinner, and then we participate in the luminary Lopet. Taking my students down here to the Luminary Lope at the first time, just to see their eyes, as they said, is this where we're going? To walk down there onto a frozen lake to see all of these ice luminaries. The two closest are made out of paper bags, but on the lake, they're all made out of ice. You can see a big pyramid there made out of ice. They're ice luminaries. I feel that my students have the experience. They're being active, learning more about the community but they're also learning. My first year down there, I realized that well, maybe I should have waited before I answered the student's question because she said, what is this when it's not a, when there's, this isn't taking place? I said, well, it's a lake. Where, where is the lake? I said, we're on the lake. We're on it? I said, yes, it's, there's ice. And then I told her, and there's fish swimming under you. <laughs> I should have waited until we off, we were off the lake to share that with her. <laughs> But there's also fire dancers. The past two years, we've made it to where the fire dancers are, and the students sit down mesmerized by watching the fire dancers out there on the lake. We also take our students, as I mentioned, to the YMCA, which is coming up in March. We have a climbing wall at Park Brook where you go across. This gives the students the opportunity to try going up. Once again, my students on the wellness committee, I want their input, I want their, their student voice, and so I asked, what could we change? What did you like? What did you want different? And they brought up, we would like to have, be able to have the opportunity to swim. The younger students have water safety, while the older students use the climbing wall. And so I took their idea to the YMCA, and they said, we can accommodate that. So this year, we'll be staying a little bit longer in the evening so that the students, half the students will be started on the climbing wall for the third through fifth, half will be in this pool, and then we will switch. So they have a great time, but also incorporating their voice. We also have in-school activities. One is with the Lopet Foundation. For the past 10 weeks leading up to the Luminary and Lopet, the Lopet Foundation provided cross-country ski lessons for the students. Free of charge, they provide our skis. They also come, pick up all our skis, transport them, and they pay for our bus when we go to the Lopet. The only thing they request is that they can send coaches out to work with our FIA department to teach the students how to cross-country ski. 
Being this is the third year, I was out there watching and it was amazing to watch the students and the progress they have made over the years with this. Most schools, or all schools I should say in the district, have a mile run, which is part one of the fitness standards. Our school does the mile run all together, so they all have numbers. We block off the streets and we run the mile out on the streets and the kids cheer each other on. And so you can see right here in the, this picture, Connie Milstein, one of my fourth grade teachers, is running with the students. This year, instead of, we have, this will be the third year we've taken our students down to Worth Park. District 279 Foundation has supported this grant and the Lopet Foundation as well. So the students learn how to mountain bike and canoe and they see what's available to them right in our community. I feel that's important for my students to be active, have different experiences, but also know what's available to them in the community. We've also been looking at changing the way we instruct our students. So our students are not sitting in typical chairs anymore and we also have them moving. We begin our day with a brain boost for all students. Our students are on our morning news and then they choose which video we will use for the day. The first week of school I chose some to use and then they've been allowed to choose them off of Geo Motion TV. So it's a surprise to me each morning what will be coming across <laughs> the entire school. But the students do choose it, choose the videos, and then also throughout the day, teachers stop to get the students up and moving. My math class is one example where every hour she has a different group of students. Halfway through, they all stand up for a brain boost. We also use stability balls and hokey stools in our classrooms. And I figured I should bring a hokey stool because nobody would know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but with our kindergarten students, Alina Healthcare paid for these. They, a few years back, we had a $10,000 grant from Alina, but throughout, over the years, they've given us many other items for our focus on fitness. This was not part of the grant, but they bought them for all of the kindergarten classrooms. And so they are stools that they rock back and forth. So you're using your core muscles while sitting. We've all, we have also been working this year with Be Fit to Learn, and we have been <clears throat> learning how to use fitness and movement directly aligned to the academic standards. So we first started with our before school activities, our after school activities, some fitness field trips, and now we are using movement directly related to the academic standards. And we're excited to see where our learning will take place and what our growth will be this year. Our students in third, fourth, and fifth with IHT are now wearing pedometers to measure their activity level, time in the moderate to vigorous activity level. This is our learning year as staff with these, but they sync with our computers so that we can align it with our data because we want to make sure that we are doing this to help with our student academic growth. Instead of doing a traditional carnival with the Lina grant a few years back, we had a health fair, but you know, to be honest, a health fair just does not sound that exciting to kids. <laughs> and you know, to, I'll be honest, not to me either. <laughs> so we came up with Park Brook Winter Funland, and so instead of having a carnival with tickets and the little trinkets that kids receive, we have flat fee, we keep it down, the cost. Parents like the idea that it's much cheaper than a carnival ever was, but it's movement activities. We also offer snowshoeing and cross-country skiing for parents, and then we also provide all the snacks for the students. So what have been the goals? Why were we doing this? You've seen what it looks like, but it all comes back to our mission, and our mission is to inspire and prepare all students with the confidence courage and competence to achieve their dreams, contribute to community, and engage in a lifetime of learning. That is where this is all rooted. We also look at what are one of the strategies, and we will create transformational system change to ensure equitable student achievement. A few years back, I looked at our interventions, our academic interventions, and I thought we have strong interventions, but what do we need? And I'm talking with some of my teachers, they said, Students are not necessarily always prepared for learning. 
And there's a variety of reasons. We thought, how do we come along and support so that we are preparing students for learning? And one way was through increasing our fitness. So our goals have been, as a school, to increase academic growth, increase positive behaviors within the school, increase experiences, and close the opportunity gap. I believe that there's the achievement gap that we must be working to close. But there's also an opportunity gap of opportunities within the community to access and just to know how to navigate. One example of that for myself was when we first went to the Twin Cities 5K. I have never run a marathon, and I never run a Twin uh, 5K until I did participate with the students. But I had no idea that there's a whole culture involved with going the day before to pick up all of these items, the, everything that takes place with a 5K or a large event. So I think about my students, and if their families have not participated in some of these events, how do I help them learn how to navigate those, just as I needed someone to help me navigate? And also to engage our students in school. So what have been the results? The first thing I look at is our academic data. We are one of the five Title I schools in this district. I look at my data. We have had the number one reading growth. These are all based upon the MAP tests and it's academic growth, not proficiency. But for EL students in schools with EL programs, we had the number one top, number one growth. And also for third grade and sixth grades. If we look at all of our students, we had the second highest percentage of students meeting or exceeding their expected growth rate. Number three for black students, number four for in math for third grade, and then we look at all students in math, we were in the top third with the number, with the fifth highest growth rate for students meeting or exceeding their expected growth. I feel as though we have to come back and always look at what are our academic scores, because if it's not making a difference, we need to figure out what we can do to change that. I also look at our behavior results. I hear from those who come to Park Brook that it's so calm. And I think, you know, we have 200 kids sitting on bouncy balls throughout the building, <laughs> and they're calling it calm. But it is a calm building. I see students engaged. I see students having fun. And I see students engaged. We have also virtually eliminated the suspensions at Park Brook. We have not been able to do this on our own. It's a staff that is willing to follow me where we are going, and they are willing to work, and they support this initiative. But we also have some community partners who greatly support us. One is the Lopet Foundation, Alina Healthcare, Three Rivers Park, where we have the bike grant and the bike fleet, Girls on the Run, Twin Cities in Motion, the YMCA in Coon Rapids, Cycle Health with the Kidderod that we'll be participating in later this month, where they are waiving the fees for all of our Park Brook students, and our District 279 Foundation. So thank you, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you, Scott. That was, um, that was really interesting. I, I thought for sure when, when you uh, had the students out on the ice, you were going to kind of go into this is probably one of the few times that you can walk on water, but the, the fish was good. The fish was good. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of times we'll, we'll hear reports, and, and it's always interesting to um, understand what different schools are doing. And um, so clearly you're, you're hitting on some of the things that are creating engagements for the students and their families. Um, and, and clearly the staff have to be engaged also. Are there other, I know you mentioned a small handful of them. Um, is it just the climate that's feeling different? Um, you know, school's fun, right? Yes. Um, I believe, when I'm looking at behaviors, I believe that it's, it's the whole climate has changed. Staff are having fun. One of my first grade teachers said, Number one, she said she would not go back to teaching without the stability balls. One of my second grade teachers said that. And my first grade teacher said she has never had so much fun and been able to laugh with her kids. Okay. And I think of the field trips, it's that relationship that we're building and just having fun with the kids. Yeah, cool, very neat. Um, board members, other, any other board members have comments or questions? 
Uh, Director Edom. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just really fascinated the entire time that you were talking um, about what you're doing with the students at um, Parkbrook. Mm -hmm. um, just made me realize when I was growing up in elementary school and I couldn't sit still and so now I know. <laughs> I used to try to tell those teachers, you know, um, it's uh, smart to move around. It's not bad. You know, I'm not a bad kid because I can't sit still. <laughs> but, and so this is really very interesting to me because I know um, the most recent research has suggested that movement actually makes kids smarter. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, Thank you. Sounds very interesting. Sounds like the kids are learning and having a lot of fun at the same time. I don't know about the lake and on the ice thing <laughs> and the snow skiing because that winter stuff just doesn't work for me. But it's really good that you know kids are learning how to um, make use of you know uh, what they have. And this is Minnesota. It's cold. You know it snows. We have frozen lakes. Why not make the best of it? So it's and, and I think you have to start early. You know, you can't wait till you know, you're well beyond your 50s to come to Minnesota and, and uh, start walking on water, right. walking on ice. <laughs> but if they, you know, if they start early, they, they learn to appreciate uh, you know, what Minnesota has to offer. So I really, I think this is really uh, very fun, very interesting. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Chair Hankey. And Director Craig. Um, thank you so much for coming in and, and doing this presentation. It's really eye-opening and fascinating to see. I'm wondering, I actually am interested in these hokey stools. I definitely need to work my <laughs> core. Um, but I'm wondering, what was the inspiration um, behind meeting with author Eric Jensen? And is that what got you started on this pathway? Is that really set the tone for the school? Yes. Eric Jensen, his book, uh, deals with poverty, mm -hmm. and one of the things that he talks about is if you are increasing the fitness, and he talks specifically about running, how you can engage students, because the simplest way for me to think about it is if you're running, the blood's flowing, or if you're moving, the blood's flowing oxygen nutrients to your brain, mm -hmm. and so he talked about that. And we were just starting, and we decided if we're going to go on this path, <clears throat> you can't just dabble in it, you need to move um, into it wholeheartedly and just increasing in one little area is not going to make the difference that we wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And then with the book Spark, they did a lot of research in different schools and the difference they were able to make in different settings by increasing the fitness and the movement was incredible. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. You. Chair Hinkey. Director Kurtz. Um, I just want to say, wow, amazing. I'm just so excited about Thanks. what is happening over at Parkbrook. I just want to thank you for coming and sharing this with us. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Director Gerhardt. I just want to say I'm really, really glad to hear what you're doing. I think for too long we've underserved students for generations with this idea of setting students in rows and neat columns and expecting them to sit still and learn and the, the human brain just wasn't built to do that we were we were built to adapt and improvise and overcome on the run to be able to survive to the next day and and this to me really represents the idea of bringing learning to the way the brain was built to learn instead of expecting the brain to adhere to some artificial construct of nice rows and columns of, of classroom desks i'd love to see you know how this progresses into the future and if there's any opportunity to, to expand this elsewhere. So thank you. You're welcome. Later in school we had a phrase for that. It was the mind can only absorb what the butt can endure. <laughs> so if you're you know if you're sitting for an hour without moving. <laughs> well I, I, I think the interesting thing to note is how many people do you know say, well I wasn't that good in school. I'm a hands on learner. Mm -hmm. right. Everybody's a hands on learner. Some people just can do without the hands better than others. People are actually not just hands-on learners, they're, they're entire body learners, and this really starts to speak to that, so this is great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I just, want to say, uh, just want to say, Scott, thank you so much for bringing this information to us. And you can see some of this happening in the, in the workforce as well. People, some people even in this room have standing desks. And uh, 
um, I see that in the working world, world as well. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Good idea. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to the next update on uh, where, where they might be out venturing to. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you. Thanks. Our next agenda item is the consent agenda. Uh, board members, are there any item or items that you'd like to remove for separate consideration? Hearing none, I would move to accept the con consent agenda as printed. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Director Craig. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries to accept the consent agenda as printed. Our next agenda item is action items, and we have the fiscal year 2017 general operating, transportation, food service, community service budget adjustments. Patricia Magnuson. Welcome, Patricia. Sure, thank you, board members and Superintendent McGuire. The purpose of this evening's presentation is to provide information on the fiscal year 2017 recommended budget adjustments to the general operation, transportation fund, food service, and community service funds. The recommendations being shared this evening are part of the annual budget planning process. Budget decisions are made using the long range financial planning framework. The framework includes a financial forecasting model. We refer to it as our base and tactics model, and that provides the basis of our budget planning for financial sustainability. The budget decisions align with the mission and strategic plan through a process that engages multiple stakeholders. Budget planning includes aligning our resources with the mission and strategic plan. There's an assessment of the impact on productivity and essential services and compliance with legal requirements. And as part of our continuous improvement efforts, this year we added a requirement to our process that describes each proposal's impact on our work to ensure equitable student achievement. And you might recall that the language that we used in our PEAR document was recommended at our board meetings, uh, at our board's November 10th work session. So we thank you for that input. The school board engages in several work sessions throughout the budget development process and at your February 2nd work session, the board considered the budget recommendations and the LRFP advisory team's assessment of impact. This is a summary of the general operating transportation fund adjustment. Um, again, in keeping with the direction that was provided by the board on November 10th, $1.5 million worth of targeted additions to the general fund budget capacity were included in the pair summary that's being proposed for consideration. In addition, one and two year expenditures due to the implement implementation of all day kindergarten are being removed from the budget. So the result is this proposed net increase to the general fund budget of $1,244,628. So the program efficiency abandonment and redirection or pair summary, which is in the board packet, provides a description of the recommended adjustments in detail along with the category for the change, the pair amount, and the summary of the change. And an important feature of the LRFP process is that budget managers also annually review their entire budgets and re make recommendations to realign resources to better meet the strategic priorities of the school district. This ensures that the budget is directly tied to the district's mission. This slide, um, describes another component of this year's budget recommendations. We are including a 123 student increase in the fiscal year 2017 enrollment projection. This is based on some new trend information we're working with. 50% of the revenue attributable to this projected student increase or $450,318 will be reserved for additional staffing capacity to be allocated when these student enrollment increases become more certain. And then as a part of our continuous improvement process, this year we continue to fully incorporate both the community service and the food service funds into the LRFP process. And the pair summary that's also included in the packet provides a description of all of these recommended adjustments as well. And the majority of these adjustments that are outlined in that pair summary are in the community service fund for expansion of ECFE and Kids Stop programming. 
So we're getting deep into the budgeting process and the final um, steps in the fiscal year 2017 budget development process are as follows. So coming up in March, we will consider the operating capital budget items at the work session and then we'll bring those to you on March 15th for final consideration. And then after that, along with direction you provide tonight and um, direction we receive in March, we'll begin building the detailed line items of the budget. We'll also be watching the legislative session and make any adjustments to the budget based on any activity that happens during that session. And then finally, um, in June, we will bring the final fiscal year 2017 budget to you for approval at the June 16th regular school board meeting. So that's the presentation of the budget. Thank you, Patricia. Um, and for folks in the audience or those who may be watching on TV, um, we had a work session a couple weeks ago where we went through um, all of the items in detail and at great length. And so um, just so you, you have that information. Um, board members, do you have any questions for Patricia? There are none. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, so with that, I will move um, the fiscal year 2017 general operating transportation food service community service budget <coughs> adjustments. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Director Enum. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries on the fiscal year um, 2017 budgets. Our next agenda item is gifts to the district. Um, I would move to graciously accept gifts to the district totaling $208,631.62. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Director Edom. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries to accept gifts to the district. Um, our next agenda item is the first reading of school board policies 512 and 532. Margaret Weston. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you, Chair Henke. Um, Board Member Superintendent McGuire. As you heard earlier this evening, the Policy Committee met on January 26th and reviewed recommendations for um, amendments to uh, two policies that are uh, recommended for first reading tonight. Uh, first, Policy 511 on student fundraising um, is a policy that establishes expectations and requirements for fundraising by students and spells out requirements for students and staff who wish to raise funds for student activities and outside charitable activities. It's not a mandated policy, but the policy committee felt that the guidance was um, useful for students and staff and families. And uh, model, our policy is based on the model policy of the Minnesota School Board Association. The proposed amendments to the policy establish criteria that allow the school board to delegate approval of some um, student fundraising and establish expectations for behavior by students in conducting fundraising activities. There are substantial changes to the administrative procedures that the committee also reviewed. Um, these changes more clearly spell out requirements for handling funds in accordance with the Uniform Financial Accounting and Reporting Standards, or UFARs, which are established by the Minnesota Department of Education for these funds. Second policy 532, currently titled Use of Peace Officers and Crisis Teams to Remove Students with IEPs from School Grounds, is a mandated policy. Um, school districts are required to have the, a policy that addresses the use of peace officers and crisis teams to remove students with IEPs from school grounds. The policy committee is recommending uh, amendments to the policy so that it will provide guidance for removal of any student from school grounds and not only students who are on um, individual educational programs. Accordingly, the proposal is to change the name of the policy to remove the reference to students with IEPs specifically and remove specific references to students within, with IEPs within the body of the policy unless there's a legal basis for making a distinction between students with IEPs and students in general education. This is the approach that has been taken by a number of other Minnesota school districts. Uh, first reading begins a four-week period for reaction to proposed policies by concerned groups or individuals. After the four-week period, the school board may adopt a policy after second reading. The proposed policies are available on the school district website with the agenda for this evening, and comments may be directed to the school board or to me. Thank you, Margaret. Um, board members, any questions for Margaret? <coughs> Hearing none, thank you, Margaret. Our next agenda item is announcements. Uh, Director Craig. Thank you. 
A closed meeting of the school board will be held on Tuesday, February 16th at 7 p.m. in room N10 at the Educational Service Center. This meeting will be closed to the public pursuant to Minnesota Statute 113D.05, Subdivision 3B, in accordance with the attorney-client privilege to discuss threatened litigation. The school board policy committee will meet on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016 at 6 p.m. in room W42 at the ESC. This meeting will be open to the public. A school board work session will be held on Tuesday, March 8th, 2016 at 6 p.m. in the forum room at the ESC. The topics will be priority results, <coughs> achievement and integration plan, fiscal year 2017 operating capital budget, and district 287 memorandum of agreement. This meeting will be open to the public. The School Board Policy Committee will meet on Monday, March 14, 2016 at 6 p.m. in room W42 at the ESC. This meeting will be open to the public. A re regular school board meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 15, 2016 at 6 p.m. in the boardroom at the ESC. This meeting will be open to the public. A negotiation strategies meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 15, 2016 at 7 p.m. in room N10 at the Educational Service Center. This meeting will be closed to the public. Thank you. And our last agenda item is adjournment. Do we have a motion? So moved. Motion by Director Gerhardt. Do we have a second? Seconded. Second by Director Burgett. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. We are adjourned at 7 p.m. Thank you, everybody.